Hi, my name is Julia Silge, and I'm a data scientist and software engineer at Posit, formerly our studio. And today in this screencast, we are going to look at this week's Tidy Tuesday data set, with about, which is about museums in the UK. And specifically, we're going to talk about how to approach feature engineering when you have a variable that has high cardinality. Um, what people mean when they say high cardinality is that some, some variable um, has many values, uh, many unique values. So an example of this you might run into in your real world work would be um, zip code. So zip code, clearly it's not a continuous variable. We don't want to treat it like a number, but often when we have it in our data, we, we, there are many, many values. So you have to decide um, how to handle it. Today, we're going to talk about how to use um, uh, likelihood encodings or effect encodings to do feature engineering for high cardinality data. So let's get started. All right, let's get started looking at museums in the UK. Um, let's read the data in here and we can take a look at what we have. So we've got info like the ID, the name, where it is. Um, we have this, this variable about accreditation, whether it is accredited or unaccredited. So this is going to be our outcome. This is what we're going to predict about the museums based on the other information. So we've got info on the governance for the museum, like how it is run, the size. Um, I'm noticing here that in the size, it says actually, where did it come from? Um, like, like, was it, you know, where did they get it? Like a, an info website. And notice some of these are um, predicted. So um, hopefully, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't, we could have a question whether we should put size in because it may be something that is, um, you know, kind of, kind of circular, uh, or you could kind of think of it as some kind of imputation, right? Like that they did for us. We have the subject matter, the year um, open and closed, and then these over here have more missing data. And then they have this uh, information about the museum, like the area that it's in can a measure of uh, what, what life is like there. They call this the area deprivation index. There's an overall one, I think I'll use that one, but then there are these other ones like crime, education, employment, health, and whatnot. Uh, so lots of interesting, and it keeps going, oh, uh, like, what's it like, um, remoter, <laughs> remoter, is there remote and remoter, I don't know, or maybe that's a typo, um, and more information on the demographic group, and just lots and lots and lots of, lots of interesting information here. Um, okay, so let us do a little bit of um, EDA. So let so first of all, you know, let's look at the outcome. Our outcome here is accreditation, and you can see here that it is, um, it's not too imbalanced. Uh, these numbers are not that far off from each other. It's, this isn't like a 90-10 imbalance or something. So that's, that's convenient. I think that means we'll be able to, um, well, we won't have to handle the class imbalance, which is nice. Um, let's look at that subject matter. I feel pretty interested in that. So if I, not means, that's not a word, that's not what we're doing with. Okay, subject matter like this. Um, there are so many there. Look, there's like 114. Um, and I bet that this is, um, you know, there's a relationship between the subject matter and whether something is accredited or not. But this is a lot of different values in this variable. So we will have to figure out how to handle that. Um, let's make a quick visualization. Let's say um, we only want the top six. Let's pull out the subject matter like so. Um, I'll make this easier to read. Okay, and so let's call this the top subjects like this. And then let's make a visualization with this. Let's do um, museums. Let's filter so that the we're only going to keep the subject matter that is in our top subjects. And um, then we'll do the same thing, count subject matter. Um, we'll count with two arguments here, accreditation, 
like so. And then we can make a visualization so we can understand that better. So let's plot to ggplot here. Um, accreditation on the x-axis and on the y-axis. And let's make this use color to make it a little easier to read. And let's say show legend equals false. And let's use facet wraps. We have a little separate facet for each of the subject of these top subject matter um, values here. And we can say scales equals free like this. All right. Okay, so this is pretty interesting, I think. We really see differences here. Just look at these first two. The museums that are about art are mostly accredited, but the museums that are the big fancy houses that they have in the UK um, are mostly unaccredited museums. And so we go through and we can see these kinds of differences. And this is, you know, this is what we would like to use in our model. Let's look at that relationship. Uh, here, I'll do it over here. Let's look at the relationship for with size. So let's say count accreditation size like this. All right. So the um, the size we can notice that uh, let's say for the huge museums they are mostly um, accredited, but for the small museums it's the other way around. Um, also, you know, we should keep in mind with the size that this is something that is partly um, imputed using the model that they built. Uh, let's now, let's look at um, governance. Uh, okay, so it looks like there are much less than the subject matter, but there's, there's quite a number here, right? 13, there were like five size buckets, 13 governance buckets. Um, so that all looks uh, pretty interesting. And let's see what that is. So uh, let's call this, let's uh, just copy paste. If I was going to do this again, maybe I write a little function top gov, top gov, and let's make this governance here. Um, uh, let's, um, let's change it to four and let us, um, let's actually make this for you. Why like that? Yeah. Okay. Nice. So, um, again, huge differences here. Uh, things that are governed, the governance model is their local authority government museums, mostly accredited. And we get down to these, like these independent, private, they are like all unaccredited practically. So we see a really big difference here. And this is the kind of information that we want to use to make a model. All right, so let's um, let's pare this data set down a little bit and get it ready for the model that I'm going to build. So I am going to take this a this original museum's um, data set. And I am going to take, I'll take the museum ID in case I want to join things back up at the end. I'm going to say accreditation. This is our outcome, the thing that we are predicting. And then let's, let's take these things, governance, size, um, subject matter. Those are the things we've kind of looked at a little bit so far. Let's take a few more. Let's take year opened, year closed. And I think I'm just going to take that general area deprivation index and use that like so. So this gives us um, <clears throat> um, eight columns or six of them are going to be predictors. Uh, but we've got some really high cardinality data in there that we're, or I don't know, maybe not really, but <clears throat> some high cardinality data in there that we're going to want to deal with. So let's... Um, uh, let's deal with those years. If you notice this, the year variables are encoded as characters. They're sort of characters and they have this sort of range. And that's because for, I looked up the documentation for this data set before um, starting filming. And these ranges are related to say, it, like there's really not, it's hard to say there's one moment when a museum 
opened or closed. And this means like this is the range when it was in the process of closing. So maybe the hours started decreasing here and then it really shut down here. So what I think I'm going to do is try to make a variable that's like the first time it started opening and then for closed, I would just want to know if it is closed or not. So let's first say, so for year opened, like this, let's say, let's say um, parse number. I think that will work well, year opened, like that. And then for um, uh, whether it's closed or not, let's just call that closed and use if else. And if the year close is equal to this um, 9999 colon 9999, oh, then we will call that open. And if not, it is closed like that. Excellent. Oh yeah, not mute, transmute, what am I doing? Okay, there we go. But it is good to see that that worked as expected. Open, close, open, close. There we go. Um, there are a few tiny variables or um, NA values. So I'm just gonna get rid of them. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change anything that is a character to a factor, like so. Nice. This one, I don't know, if I was going to be extra careful, I would change that one back. Museum ID. Um, like that, because that one is not really, that's like an ID variable. I don't know that if that's important or not, but. Okay, let's call this museums parsed. And this, I can do a glimpse on it, if I can spell it. <clears throat> so we have got these nine, nine. Oh, I need to remove that one. Okay, let's, let's do it here. Minus year closed. Minus year closed, like that. Okay. There we go. I think this is right now. Yes. So this is like an ID column that tells us what we're looking at. We would not use that as a predictor. This is the outcome. And then these are all going to be the predictors, the things we use to predict whether uh, a museum is accredited or not. Uh, all right, let's do it. So um, the kind of uh, big focus of this of this screencast is talking about feature engineering for high cardinality data. And for us, it is this subject matter um, variable that had, you know, over a hundred different values in it. Most models, if you throw that in, um, it is going to, uh, it just really blows up the um, the, 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 the feature space, um, and it can make some models, you know, not fit very well. It can make it take a long time. It can make, make it be a complicated model. And, um, we're going to talk about a way to handle that. Before we start about talk about the feature engineering, let's, uh, do a, set up how we're going to spend our data budget here. So, um, we have a certain amount of budget, uh, data, and we are going to, um, First split it into testing and training. So I'm gonna use initial split. I am going to use this here and I am going to stratify with on accreditation. Accreditation, like so. So this um, accreditation often helps, it seldom hurts. This isn't super imbalanced data, but I still think it is gonna be a good idea. So we'll, we can get our training, our tra uh, training <clears throat> data out of the split. And then we will do the testing data out of the split here. Okay, and then the next thing we need is a set of resamples because we are going to be doing a fairly complicated feature engineering approach here and we need to make sure we evaluate it within resampling to make sure we're not overfitting or getting a 
overly optimistic view of how our model will perform. So let's create some folds. I'm going to, this is kind of, you know, you're just going to use the basic um, V fold cross validation. I will resample the training data. And again, I will stratify because it um, is, like I said, often helps, seldom hurts. Okay, so here's what we have. We have 10 folds. There's like 300 or so examples in the in the now in the assessment sets of each of these splits and that seems pretty good to me I'm pretty happy with that so now now that we have training data and we have folds we can start to work on the um, the feature engineering so in tiny models there is a package called embed which provides recipe steps for um, creating a kind of encoding or an embedding for some kind of data. So it we are so we're gonna um, start our recipe and then we're gonna use one of the steps from this recipes extension package. So our uh, we're gonna pr um, predict accreditation with everything else. Uh, we are going to put our training data here. And then the first thing I think I'll do is update the role uh, of that ID variable because it's not, not a predictor. I do not want to use it as a predictor. So I'll say new role equals ID like so. I think it's helpful to keep this around if I want to do some sort of um, exploration of results. I can use that to join things up later. Um, and now I am going to use an embed step. So. I am going to use some um, <clears throat> a recipe step where I am going to make likelihood encodings, which are also called um, effect encodings. So the what a what a feature engineering step like this does is it will take something that maybe has very high cardinality and then replace the values with a um, with a numeric value. And the way you find out the numeric value is by uh, training a little mini model um, just for feature engineering where you say, where you discover what is the effect that um, say the military, the the sea and seafaring boats and ships um, <clears throat> Museums, how does that affect uh, accreditation, probability of accreditation, compared to, say, the our fine arts museums and whatnot? So we implement it like this step, len code. I'm going to use the simplest one, which is uh, just uses a generalized linear model. And so I'm going to say, what do I want to um, make the effect encoding for? What do I want to make this likelihood encoding for? And then this actually does use the outcome. So it will train a little mini model, in this case, a generalized linear model, and it will use that to, um, uh, to say how, how does subject matter affect accreditation and store that. Um, I am going to plan to use a a, an XGBoost model, which requires everything to be in a numeric form. So I'm going to create dummy variables for everything else. So at this point, that will be governance and size and closed, open versus closed. So those will all go to dummy variables. So let's call this my museum recipe here. And remember, uh, subject matter is the one that has over 100 levels. And so that's why I'm using the um, effect encoding or the likely encoding here. So let's do this. Uh, accreditation. I keep spelling that wrong. OK, perfect. So now, uh, what, what did this do? I am going to prep the recipe here, which means estimate um, you know, train that little model, do all the estimation that we need to for um, from the training data that we have. I can get the data out with bake new data equals null. So this just gets back out the transform data and maybe it will help me to do like if I want to see it, I'll use skimmer here. Okay, so we have um, a a fa oh it's a factor at this point I guess 
Yeah, it's fine. But anyway, accreditation has two values. It's the outcome. And then here are all our numeric variables. So we've got subject matter. Those 100 different levels got trans got transferred to um, one. It's still only in one um, variable. Uh, one, there's still only one predictor called subject matter, but now instead of having a hundred different values, it's numeric with a mean and standard deviation and like all these values. So it, we, we used that, um, that GLM model to, um, to, uh, learn values that belong to each of those entries in the subject matter. Then we, year opened, this index, and then these are things that were that are that were um, converted to dummy variables. So they are all zero one zero one zero one, and so you can see the mean there to see what the distribution is. And then the same thing happened for these guys here. Um, so so you you may be wondering, well, where is that model? How does that work? Um, how do I get at it uh, if I want to look at it and see what it's like? So you can do that if I if I I'm going to prep the um, recipe again and then I'm going to tidy it and these are the two steps and so then if I tidy with a number equals one like this it I actually can get all of that out so these these values here are for um, uh, what is the effect of say of a prehistorical archaeology museum on being accredited or not? Is it positive or negative? Um, and so all of our many hundred plus levels of the subject matter museums now all have a value like this. And so we can, um, um, you know, like at prediction time, we would be able to uh, say, oh, what kind of museum are you? Let me go and pick out the value that I know for that and replace it with that. What if there are new new uh, subject matter for, for museums? So the great thing about these kinds of approaches, these effect encodings or likelihood encodings, is that they also um, can do something when you have, um, I think, is it new? No, it's, I think it's new dot not new. Um, so this is basically the, um, you know, what, what, what is basically the, the average there, you know, or not the average, but the, um, the, the, the effect of not knowing of the sort of just, we, we don't have information here. What is the effect on the accreditation? So this means that this kind of model can handle new levels at prediction time really really nicely, which is great, especially when it comes to high cardinality data, because who knows when you're going to get some other, you know, other new kind of subject matter that gets uh, thrown in here. So it's really good. Um, I am using the sort of simplest or more, most straightforward kind of um, likelihood encoding. But if you are going to do this, you may be interested in looking in a full, in a, um, uh, a linear mixed model or a fully Bayesian approach. And what this lets you do is uh, do um, pooling so that, uh, let's say some of the subject matters, I, I we know this is true, like some of them we've measured a bunch of times, some of them we have only measured, um, we have only measured just like, like, maybe two times. And so we are less sure that that value is right than the one that we have measured a hundred, you know, uh, 20 times or a hundred times. So, um, a fully Bayesian model, uh, or like some of these other approaches, what, what you can do is you can, um, let the, any extreme values, um, though that you haven't measured very well, they will get pulled towards uh, the middle, get pulled, which is which is good in many realistic situations. Let's just keep going with the GLM, which is like sort of the the basic, and see how that works. Um, all right, let's put it together in a model. So I am going to make a let's call it XGB spec. I'm going to use a, a XGBoost model. This is a pretty good data size and type to do this. Um, uh, boosted tree models like XGBoost have a ton of um, tuning parameters. I'm going to tune here. Uh, let's tune three of them. I, there's many that you can tune. I'm going to tune three of them that I th 
that often have the biggest effect. And then I'm going to set the learn rate pretty high um, so that it finishes <laughs> fairly quickly. But you could tune this too. I'm just kind of like had setting it to a level that's pretty high. Um, uh, I'm going to, the this is the default, so I don't really need to do this, but let's do it. And then let's set the mode. So I'm doing classification here. So this is an XGBoost specification that where I'm tuning three values. I could tune more um, if I wanted to more thoroughly explore the hyperparameter space. So we're going to put our recipe in. Our recipe, we are going to put our X, our specification, and then we are ready to go. Now, um, we are going to use these this, these folds that we created. Where did they go? Here they are. Um, and I just want to comment here on uh, when you are using a fairly powerful feature engineering approach, um, like, say, training a little mini model for your feature engineering, um, it's really important that you could use good practices around um, estimating performance to avoid fooling yourself that your model is doing better than it really is or that it will do when exposed to new data. So it's really important to use good statistical practices like resampling, for um, estimating performance for tuning when you're in a situation like this. Um, I am going to, um, XGBoost models, um, the, the hyperparameter configurations, um, often it is, often there are ones that perform really well and ones that perform really badly right away. So it's a really good fit for for racing methods. So I'm going to use fine tune, um, the package that has some extra special tuning methods. I'm going to use, I'm going to use this using all the cores that I have on my machine. And then I'm going to use tune, did I not do it? I'm going to use tune race, um, ANOVA. So what this does is it will try all of the hyperparameter configurations on a set of resamples, um, see, and then use ANOVA to, like, use statistical tests to figure out which ones are, look statistically different from each other, like which ones are the good ones versus the bad ones, and then um, go to the next resample and, and basically try to drop ones that are performing very badly over time. So I am going to pass in my workflow. I am going to press in my folds. This is, whoops, the folds. This is what it's using. Um, let's try uh, something moderate here for this demo. Um, in, in a production environment, I would probably try more here. And then, um, uh, let's see, control race. There's like a verbosity here. Yeah, verbosity. Bose, a limb, true, which is kind of nice when it's going. So you can see where it's throwing things away. Let's call this XGB result, like so. And we definitely, definitely, definitely need to set the seed. I'll use a different one than what I used for. Not that it, you know, matters, but okay. All right, so let's kick this off. So um, here is what is going on. It has these 10 resamples, and it is going to, as it goes through the 15 possible configurations, hyperparameter configurations, in the first resample, it's trying all of them. Then it will do a little statistical test to see... Um, uh, which one, you know, like, like measure how they're different from each other. And then it will go to the next fold and it will say, um, uh, uh, in that next fold, which ones am I still looking at and whatnot? Okay. It finished. I think it will, I've talked about tuning or racing before. Let's, uh, let's look at this because it will make it simpler to talk about XGB if we're looking at the results. So for this, so for this, um, this result that we have, 
this result of the racing method. So we start over here on the left and go to the right. And first, for the first, you know, like one, two, three resamples, it it tried all 15 configurations. But after that, it, you know, it looked at how these are different from each other and said, you know what, I'm dropping all of them. Or I'm, but the last three, I'm dropping, you know, um, 12 or so. And then it kept going with these two until the statistical said, statistical test said, yep, those are worse too. And then at the end, I only have this one at the end and it goes all the way to the end because we want to have the full 10 resamples um, to estimate the performance as accurately as possible. So here is how that is, um, here, that's how that works. That's how racing works. It's like they're in a race, all the hyperparameter configurations are in a race and you're seeing which ones are doing well and which ones are doing badly and you don't keep going with the ones that are doing badly. All right, racing, I think is, I love using racing with XGBoost because it's like so efficient and gets you to something that is very, that performs very well, very, very quickly, which is nice. All right, so here is our, um, here is our metrics. So we have accuracy and ROCAUC here. So this is from the, this is estimated from the 10, resamples on this, the, here are hyperparameters that we used here. So that's, that's the performance that we get um, here from this tuning result. Let's say that looks good to us. We are gonna, um, we are gonna move forward. So the, what we will do is we will take that workflow, which is tunable, and then we will um, finalize it with this result. So we can do that by saying select best XG boost result. And I mean, it's the same, but I'll put accuracy here. It, it would not be different if I put ROCAUC here. And then I am going to fit it one, I'm going to use last fit. So what this function needs at this point is the split, the first initial split. And so this is a, a what is going to happen here? Let's call it XG boost last for last fit. So it's fitting this model with these hyperparameters on all of the training data. And then it is m estimating performance using the testing data. So um, uh, like I mentioned before, when we use this kind of feature engineering approach that is very powerful, um, we wanna make sure that we're using our data budget in the most responsible way, i.e. we don't touch our testing data until we get to the very end here. So we can collect metrics on the testing data, XGB last like so. And this is within, this is close to this, you know, within the uh, the error there, or two point times from the error, whatever it is that we're doing. Um, so great. So these are the metrics on the, um, oh, I've already started this. Evaluate. There, this should go here. <laughs> Um, okay, so now uh, what else do we want to do in terms of understanding our model results? We can get predictions out from this uh, last fit object. So this, notice how big this is. This is on the testing data, just like this is. I could make some plots with this. Um, maybe I can make a confusion matrix. Uh, accreditation, credit and uh, we need, whoops, pred class like that. And um, this looks, this looks pretty good actually. Um, we're not doing much worse on one of these than the other one. That's actually pretty close proportionally, which is which is nice, which is good. Our model ha is doing a pretty good job of recognizing both accredited and unaccredited um, museums, which is good. And then I think the last thing I want to do is I want to do a quick um, variable importance uh, exploration. So I'm going to use the VIP package. I'm going to take XGB last. I will get out the engine underneath. So this is the, um, this is the XGBoost object that's inside of there. We can look at it and see it's an XGBoost object. And then well, um, I'm going to call VIP on it, just regular, just the basics here. 
And so what we're doing here is we are using the tree structures of the, you know, we had like 600 trees or so in here. Use the tree structures um, that we have stored and estimate variable importance um, from the structure of the model. So that's what we're doing here with the, with the calling this on an XGBoost object. And we can see that the mo like the most um, important variable is from governance, is it a private? And then the next one is, is if it is still open or not, uh, accredited, um, I bet, did we look at this? I'm sure accredited museums are more likely to still be open versus closed. But then look what's third, it's subject matter. So what this tells us here is that like that was probably worth doing the the model, um, like the mini model where we do the effect encoding or the likelihood encoding, um, because it turns out it is quite important to whether a um, whether a museum is is uh, accredited or not, like the what kind of museum it is, does matter, and um, so this approach was worth doing. All right, we did it. So we use um, likelihood encodings or infect encodings to handle this high cardinality variable, the subject matter of what the museums are about. It had, you know, over a hundred values, um, and we were able to replace those values with a numeric, um, a, a numeric value that that tells us the effect of that on the outcome. So it's it's like kind of like a supervised. Um, a feature engineering kind of approach because we use the outcome, I guess you could say. And like I said before, it's really important that when you use this kind of powerful feature engineering approach that you use good practices around, um, around resampling and understanding how your model is going to perform on new data. So um, I hope this was helpful. It was super interesting to learn a little bit about these museums and I will see you next time.